Hi there, today we're gonna to start talking about thermodynamics, which is the study of heat energy. And we've already talked about how energy can be transformed from one form into another. Uh, in the past, we talked about potential energy being turned into kinetic energy and vice versa. In this unit, we're just going to focus on heat energy. And just an interesting tidbit, the development of this concept of heat energy roughly corresponded with what was called the Little Ice Age in Europe, which occurred in the 16th through 19th centuries. Um, and I have a nice image here that I like to show uh, that shows some paintings by Peter Bruegel the Elder, um, who lived in that time frame. And it just gives us a nice perspective of how, how cold it was. It was this, this little peak in, um, in cold temperatures that Europe saw, and you can see that outlined here in the paintings. And I like to think about that because it's a reminder that when people are cold, what do they think about? They think about heat. So before we go on, I wanna talk about something called the kinetic molecular theory. And this was developed in the mid 19th century, so the mid 1800s, and it's foundational to everything else that we'll be doing. It assumes that all matter is made up of many tiny particles that are always in motion. So I'd like to show you a couple of snapshots from a FET simulation that I'll have to show you in person when I'm there. I can't do it here on, on my iPad um, because it gives you an idea of, of what we're talking about. We need to have this foundation before we can go on and talk more about thermal energy. Okay, so here's a screenshot of the FET simulation and I've got a couple of them that I'd like to show you. And again, I'll show these to you in person also. But if you can imagine, this is a solid. Um, solids have a rigid structure. They have a definite shape and a definite volume. And if you could picture this, what's actually happening in the simulation, and this is a snapshot, so we can't really see it. But what's actually happening in the simulation is that we see that these, um, these tiny particles, in this case atoms, are constantly in motion. So they're constantly moving from side to side, kind of vibrating back and forth um, in place. And that's what we mean by everything, even something that's a solid that seems to be very rigid. So your desktop, your stylus, um, your peanut butter sandwich, whatever it might be, is actually made up of many molecules that are constantly in motion. And this is a snapshot of what it looks like as a liquid. And again, this doesn't do it justice because, um, because it's a snapshot instead of a simulation, but all of these molecules are constantly moving and they're rolling over each other, and this is now when it's a liquid, and so these um, these don't have a definite shape, they do have a definite volume, and we'll talk more about that later when we talk about states of matter. That's why liquids can fit the shape of whatever container you put them into. But again, the main thing is that these are constantly in motion, and as something heats up, I don't know if you can tell, but the difference in temperature here is a little bit higher um, the molecules are actually moving faster. And then lastly, this is an image of what it would look like as a gas. And again, you can't see it, but each of these individual molecules or atoms has its own kinetic energy and is moving, it's colliding with other molecules and with the side of the container and there's little collisions that are happening. Notice the temperature is a little bit higher. Um, so as thing, as these atoms and molecules move faster, the temperature also goes up, which is an important observation to make. Now in your structured notes, um, I said that I would give you an example drawing of an atom. So here's just one model, and we'll talk more about this in chemistry next year, but it's important to have a basic idea, and chances are you already know some of this. Um, so we talk about the nucleus of an atom, so I'll draw it off to the side here. And inside of the nucleus, there are particles called protons and neutrons. Protons have a positive charge, and neutrons are neutral. So I'll just write an N there. And um, typically, however many neutrons there are is the number of protons. Um, so those are approximately equal. And then outside of the atom are what we call electrons. And they have a negative charge. You can either write them as a negative or an E with a negative next to it. And however many protons there are, that's how many electrons there are in a balanced atom. And those orbit around, so this is one example of what it might look like, the atom. 
in a random pattern and we, we can't predict where those electrons are at any given point in time. If something, <clears throat> certain um, materials lose an electron easily, um, it makes them more stable and we call those an ion. If something gains or loses an electron and it's no longer neutral, so then it would either have a positive charge or a negative overall charge. Um, so that's about all I can explain, I think, without being there. But it's important that you at least understand the parts of the atom and the fact that electrons can be lost easily. So that's what would give something a negative or a positive charge. Um, and that's why, for example, if you go down a plastic slide or you rub your feet on the floor wearing wool socks, your hair might stand up on end or you get a little shock. Um, and that's because you've picked up charge somewhere. Okay, so this is an important concept distinction between thermal energy and temperature. So I want to make sure you jot down these definitions because we'll come back to them. Thermal energy, we say, is a measure of the total, and I underlined that word because it's in your notes and it's important for you to emphasize, the total internal motion of an object's particles. And when I say internal motion, think back to that FET simulation that we just saw. It has to do with the kinetic energy of the atoms and molecules, and that's what we mean. That's what we mean by particles, atoms and molecules. Temperature is a measure of the average internal motion of the object's particles. And again, there's a big distinction here, and I really want you to make that clear between um, the words total and the word average. So I would even highlight that if I were you in your notes, because there's a big difference there. Thermal energy has to do with total energy. Temperature has to do with the average internal motion. Here's an example I like to use to help distinguish between this. So let's suppose that we're comparing our class with a kindergarten class. Hopefully these answers are easy. Which class has the larger average height? Well, that would be us, right? On average, we are all taller. So us. Um, and then which class has the larger total height? Well, what do you think? I think that it depends. It's probably us, isn't it? However, I told you that the kindergarten class actually had a hundred students in it. If that was the case, we would still have the larger average height, right? The larger average height. But which class would have the larger total height? Well, it would be that kindergarten class because there's so many more of them, a hundred of them. So the total would be much bigger. So again, think about that for a minute. On average, we are definitely taller than the kindergarten class. On average, we are taller. However, if we look at total height, it's the number of items that matters. So we're talking about total, it's the number of items that makes a difference. Okay, well how does this relate to temperature and thermal energy? Well, remember a minute ago we said that temperature has to do with the average kinetic energy of the molecules and thermal energy we said was the total kinetic energy of the molecules. So again go back to that FET simulation in this case we've got a cup of hot cocoa and a cup of cold cocoa and I'd like us to compare these two. So which one is hotter? This is a no-brainer hopefully the hot cocoa has a higher thermal energy, or sorry, a higher temperature. We know that just because it's, it's hotter. You don't have to overthink that. But what that means, based on our definition, is that on average, its molecules are moving faster. So if I could picture that fat simulation and go to a liquid, and I compared these two objects, in the hot cocoa, we would see that each of the molecules, if these are my molecules, they're actually moving around at a faster rate and that's what makes it hotter than the cup of cold cocoa. Same number of molecules because they're identical sizes but on average these molecules are moving a little bit slower.
So, and if I were to add up the total number of molecules and the total amount of kinetic energy that each molecule had, we would see that the hot cocoa also had the bigger number. So it also has the higher thermal energy. Um, so again, this is like the kindergarten class versus us. If we were comparing identical size classes, so both classes had 25 students, we're like the cup of hot cocoa. On average, we have the bigger numbers. We have the taller height, and if we add up all of our heights, if we have the same number of people as the kindergarten class, we would find that we still would end up with the larger number because these two are equal in size, so equal number of molecules. Okay. So now let's look at a different comparison. This time my cup of hot cocoa is very small, so it has a smaller number of molecules. Over here the cup of cold cocoa is large, so it has a larger number of molecules. And so the first question is which one has the higher temperature? And that's still going to be the hot cocoa. Because on average, remember with averages, it doesn't matter how many molecules there are. Um, on average, its molecules are moving faster, so that hasn't changed. But what's different here is that the thermal energy could be larger in the cold cocoa. And the reason for that is because it contains more molecules. And remember, just like the kindergarten class, if we had 100 of them and we added up all of their heights, it would end up being bigger than our class total height. Um, that's what's going on here. And every year on your test, <clears throat> so for you guys for your final, um, I ask a question about hot cocoa and an iceberg. Which one would have a larger thermal energy? And an iceberg, you probably know this, but when you see an iceberg, it's just the tip of the iceberg is what we say. So if I have blue water here, um, the iceberg, all you see is just the tip of the iceberg and everything else underneath is actually quite large. So this has a huge number of molecules. Um, and so it definitely would have a larger thermal energy compared with the hot cocoa. Okay, so just to recap. And you had some pictures, hopefully, in your structured notes that you could write this down on. Um, and if you need to go back, I'll post this so that you can actually go back and re-listen to what I said. But here's some general um, observations. So thermal energy, remember, is the total number, or total kinetic energy of the particles. It's an important word to keep in mind. Whereas temperature is the average kinetic energy. Thermal energy does depend on the mass or the number of particles of an object. And remember, by particles, we mean atoms and molecules. Temperature does not, because remember, it's an average. And if there's an average, it doesn't matter how many particles there are. And with thermal energy, if you add thermal energy, like if I were to heat up a pot of water on the stove, what's actually happening is it increases the speed of the atoms and molecules and increases the number of collisions. <clears throat> <coughs> Temperature gets measured with thermometers. And I have a couple of those that I'll show you um, when I come back to class. And those temperatures um, reach something called thermal equilibrium. And thermal equilibrium I'll talk about in just a moment, but it allows us to be able to take a temperature. So for example, I'm homesick today, and the way I know I'm sick is I have a fever. And um, when I put that thermometer into my mouth, it is able to reach thermal equilibrium. So here's an image that shows us and helps us understand what thermal equilibrium is. And the definition, it is a state in which the rate of energy flow between two objects is equal and their temperatures are the same. And it's important to note that heat always flows from hot objects to cold objects. So if you've ever accidentally left the door open in the winter and someone has said, close the door, you're letting all the cold air in, that's not actually true. What's happening is the hot air from inside the house is trying to go outside um, and to heat up the air until the temperatures are the same. And that, that won't happen or it'll take a lot of energy for that to happen because your heater will kick on and you'll, it'll constantly try and do that. So down here we have an image at the bottom of an object that's hot versus one that's cold. 
And what you'll notice is that they're, um, the arrows here, the vectors, are actually a lot longer on the hot object. And on the cold object, they're smaller. So that's showing us a representation of the kinetic energy of each object. If we place them next to each other, they will um, eventually reach what's called thermal equilibrium, where all or approximately all of the molecules have about the same kinetic energy. And what happens, again, is that heat always goes from the hot object to the cold object until it's balanced out. So again, if I put a thermometer in my mouth, um, the heat from my body is transferred to that thermometer until thermal equilibrium is reached and then the thermometer has a mechanism to allow us to be able to figure out what that temperature is. Before we move on to talk about temperature scales, I'll leave you with one thought. When we talk about something being hot in temperature, remember hotness is just the property of an object that's called temperature and it's based on a definite scale. And what we know is that the hotter an object is, that means the faster its particles or its atoms and molecules are moving, which means on average its kinetic energy is larger. All right, so let's talk about temperature scales. Um, here in the United States we use Fahrenheit. Um, but around the world, Celsius is used and Kelvin is used in the scientific community. And I'll tell you a little bit about each one. You do need to be able to convert between all three scales, and I'll give you those conversions. Um, so, Fahrenheit uh, was developed by a gentleman named Gabriel Daniel Fahrenheit, and he was Dutch. He was from the Netherlands, which is also known as Holland. And zero on the Fahrenheit scale was the coldest temperature he could create in a laboratory with a mixture of ice and salt. So zero degrees Fahrenheit, again, is the coldest temperature he could make, so he just called it zero. Um, and in the Fahrenheit scale, 32 degrees Fahrenheit is the freezing point of water, and 212 degrees Fahrenheit is the temperature at which water boils. This is the scale that we use um, so we know, for example, if it's 32 degrees outside, there's a chance we might have a snow day if there's precipitation. The next scale is called the Celsius scale, and the Celsius scale and the Kelvin scale make a lot of logical sense. They're both used in the metric system. The Fahrenheit scale is not, and really is not, as logical as the other ones. Um, so the Celsius scale was developed by Anders Celsius, and he was from Sweden, and it's based on the properties of water. So he decided to make the freezing point of water equal to zero degrees Celsius and the boiling point equal to 100. And we call this a centigrade scale because between the freezing point and boiling point of water there are 100 increments. So it's centi, centigrade scale. Okay, Kelvin. Kelvin is also a centigrade scale, which is important to note. And it's a little bit unique because it's based on the properties of matter. And what we know is that temperatures don't appear to have an upper limit. In other words, you can keep adding heat to something and it'll get hotter and hotter and hotter. There is no such thing as a warmest, hottest possible temperature. Um, but what we do know in contrast about lower limits is that um, as materials cool down, they contract. Um, and so as something gets colder and colder and colder, and once you get to see the FET simulation with the kinetic molecular theory, you'll see this, that as things get colder and colder and colder, they don't, the molecules don't move as quickly. And so um, Kelvin hypothesized that there must be a point where the molecules can't possibly move any slower. And that is the temperature that we'll call zero Kelvin. And we'll call that absolute zero. And it's the temperature at which all molecular motion stops. So coldest possible temperature is zero Kelvin. We call it absolute zero. And it's the temperature at which all molecular motion stops. And as I mentioned, it's also a centigrade scale because there's 100 increments between the freezing point and the boiling point of water. And on the Kelvin scale, 273 Kelvin is the freezing point of water, and 373 Kelvin is the boiling point of water. So again, you'll notice that there are 
a hundred increments there between those two points. So it's also a centigrade scale. So what I'd like you to do now is to pull up on your iPad Transparency 12-1 and answer the questions with your partner. And uh, we have the video, go ahead and pause the video with this screen up um, so that you can use this kind of as a reference. You also have this on your iPad if you need it on your structured notes. But transparency 12-1 um, just asks you to make some observations about the different temperatures that are on here. Okay? And then we'll check back in for the answers. Alrighty, here are your answers. So for number one, in what ways are the temperature scales the same or different? All three scales have something to do with the freezing and boiling point of water. Degrees on the Celsius and Kelvin scales are the same size, which is why they're both um, centigrade scales. On the Fahrenheit scale, the degrees are smaller. So if you think about it, between the freezing point and boiling point of water on the Fahrenheit scale, we go for all the way from 32, which is freezing, up to 212. So that's a lot of increments between the freezing and boiling point, whereas in Celsius, it's just 0 to 100. There's only 100 increments. Um, and the Celsius and Fahrenheit scales can both have negative values, which I think is important to note whereas Kelvin cannot. The coldest possible temperature, remember, is zero Kelvin. And I probably should have mentioned that um, with the Kelvin scale, we don't use a degree symbol. We would just write zero Kelvin, or maybe we would write five Kelvin. There's no degree symbol. And number two, a Kelvin is a unit that represents a temperature increase that's equal to one degree on the Celsius scale. Number three, the freezing and boiling point of water on each scale. For Celsius, that's zero and 100. Kelvin is 273 and 373, so again, notice there's no degree symbol there. Fahrenheit is 32 degrees and 212 degrees. Number four, body temperature. Um, in Fahrenheit, you probably know, is 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. In Celsius, it's 37 degrees, and in Kelvin, that would be 310. And then number five, what advantage does the Kelvin scale have for scientific measurement? One is that there's no negative values on the Kelvin scale. So we won't ever get a negative value for other units if we use it in operations. And then last but not least, um, zero. Why is zero considered to be relative on the Celsius scale and an absolute value on the Kelvin scale? So zero on the Celsius scale has to do with the freezing point of water. It doesn't have anything to do with the movement of the molecules in the matter. And it's possible for objects to be colder. So it's just a relative number. But on the Kelvin scale, remember, absolute zero is that point at which all molecular motion stops. So it's absolute because a lower, a lower temperature cannot exist. Um, number seven, the liquid in one container drops 100 degrees Fahrenheit and another drops 100 degrees Celsius. How does the change in thermal energy within the two com containers compare? Because each Fahrenheit degree is smaller than each Celsius degree, a temperature drop of 100 degrees Fahrenheit represents a smaller change in the thermal energy than a drop of 100 degrees Celsius. So it's important to just take note of that, that if we change the temperature by 100 degrees Fahrenheit, that is not as much as changing it by 100 degrees Celsius. And then number eight, um, there is a point where Celsius and Fahrenheit thermometers are almost the same, and that's 40, negative 40 degrees Celsius and negative 40 degrees Fahrenheit. And just a fun fact, when I lived in Switzerland, one of my good friends um, was from Russia. Her name was Anna Skorobogatova. And she lived, or went to college in Siberia, and this was a pretty con constant temperature for them. Um, so, but it was interesting, we figured out that negative 40 in Fahrenheit and Celsius um, were about the same temperature. So, here are your temperature conversions. Um, there is no direct conversion from Fahrenheit to Kelvin. What you'll notice is easiest is if you're given a Fahrenheit temperature, you need to convert it to Celsius and then convert that Celsius to Kelvin. That's probably the easiest way to do it. Um, for 
Fahrenheit to Celsius, you'll notice, and I want to make sure that you write these down correctly, you have boxes to write these on your structured notes. Um, there's a five ninths out in front, and then there are parentheses. So take note of the fact that there are parentheses in the first equation. The second equation has no parentheses. These are actually inverse functions for those of you in pre-calculus. Um, and then because Celsius and Kelvin use the same scale, they're both centigrade numbers, then that means that all we have to do is add 273 to a Celsius temperature to get the Kelvin temperature. And to get a Kelvin temperature, all we need to do is to, or sorry, to get the Celsius temperature, all we need to do is subtract 273. Remember that you can never have a negative Kelvin temperature. That's why we're adding the 273 here instead of subtracting anything. So take a moment, pause the video if you need to, to actually write these down because we're going to do a sample problem in just a minute. Okay, one of my good friends from college is named Daoud, and he grew up in Dubai in the United Arab Emirates. And in the summer, it can get up to 44 degrees Celsius, um, which is very different than 44 degrees Fahrenheit. So I'd like you and your partner to take a moment, um, pull out your calculator, and find this temperature in Fahrenheit and Kelvin. And for this problem, and for some of your problems on your test, I'll say round to the nearest degree. So pause for a moment and find that answer. Okay, let's see how you did. Um, so if we round to the nearest degree, 44 degrees Celsius ends up being 111 degrees Fahrenheit or 317 Kelvin. Um, so pretty warm day and that's actually a very typical summer day there. Okay, so we've talked about temperature. Um, we're going to finish off talking about thermal energy today and how thermal energy can get transferred between one object and another. There are three forms of trans or three ways to transfer thermal energy. The first is through something called conduction. The next is something called convection. And the last is called radiation. And on your notes, I left you space to, to write these words. That conduction and convection depend on the presence of matter, whereas radiation does not. So let's talk first about conduction. Um, you might remember when we talked about electrical conductors that they easily allowed charge to pass through them or flow through them. Well, a good thermal conductor allows energy to transfer, uh, thermal energy to transfer through it. Um, and here's how that happens. First of all, conduction is really common in solids, and it's the transfer of kinetic energies when particles collide. It also requires contact between different objects, or between the two objects. Um, so, the example I like to use, and this is a plastic spoon, but imagine it's metal, um, is a metal spoon in a pot of hot soup. And maybe you've done this before where you go to heat up some soup on the stove, you stir it with a metal, um, a metal spoon, and what happens is that you come back later and you go to touch that spoon and you go, ouch, because it was hot. What happened is that if you consider the fact that underneath the pot or the pan, there's a heating element, and that heating element is warm, and so it's transferring, or it's got lots of molecules that are moving really fast, if you can imagine that. It's usually made out of, let's say it's a gas stove or an electric stove, and often those are made out of metal. Um, as it's doing that, as those molecules are moving faster and faster, they begin to collide with the bottom of the pot. And because metal is a good thermal conductor, the pot starts to heat up and those molecules start going faster and faster and faster. And then the same thing happens within the soup. And because that spoon is touching the bottom of the metal pot, it also starts to heat up and all of those molecules start moving faster and faster. And so I'm, I'm drawing these arrows just to show that as time goes on, the speed of these individual um, molecules, so therefore the kinetic energy gets bigger. Um, I just talked about a thermometer and how if you put that in your mouth, um, so I have a fever right now, and my temperature, uh, the temperature of my mouth is warmer than the thermometer, and so the, the kinetic energy of those molecules transfers to the thermometer, 
which causes its kinetic energy, the kinetic energy of its molecules to speed up and they move faster and faster. If you've ever sat on a chair that someone else has sat on right before you, people can transfer thermal energy too, and that happens through contact. So by sitting on the chair, your body heat naturally warms up the temperature of the chair. Okay, next, convection. Um, this is most common in fluids, and by fluids we mean anything that is a liquid or a gas or a plasma, which we haven't defined yet, but um, fluids are liquids, gases, and plasmas. And it's the movement of fluids caused by their different densities at different temperatures. So some examples, um, a convection oven. If you have a convection oven at home, what that does is it actually cooks things faster because it constantly circulates the air so there aren't pockets that are hotter or colder so things bake more evenly. Um, weather patterns are strictly based off of convection. Um, warmer temperature air and colder temperature air coming together creates what's called the jet stream and that's what um, creates our weather patterns around the globe. Heating your home is also an example of convection. Um, if you're like me, you have heating vents on your floor or on your ceiling, and the air coming out through those is what heats the entire room because as the air comes out, it mixes with the air that's already in the room until thermal equilibrium is reached. And again, air is a gas, so it's, it's mixing those temperatures and transferring that thermal energy without having to actually touch. And then maybe you've done this if you have a bathtub that's too hot or maybe a bowl of soup that's too hot and you add some cold water or an ice cube to it um, because you know that if you swirl it around a little bit that that will change the overall temperature. Um, it will cause thermal equilibrium to be reached. They'll be balanced out. This isn't a great photo image, <clears throat> but I think it does a nice job of explaining this. So if you have soup in a pan, that's going to be heated by convection. So as the, as the pan heats up, um, that heat energy from the stove, for example, is transferred to the pan by conduction. And then within the pan, um, things that are hotter will rise. So the hot soup will rise, the cool soup falls to the bottom, and takes the hot soup's place until eventually all is the same temperature. And then most pans have a handle that is a thermal insulator that doesn't conduct the heat very well. And here's one more image showing that. So the heat from the stove transfers energy to the uh, to the pan through conduction. So again, it's transferring that thermal energy. Within the pan, we see that um, heat rises, so the warm soup will rise, the cold soup will fall. In that process, everything becomes the same temperature. And then in the last image, um, if you were to hold your hands close to a heating element that was on or an open flame, you've probably done this maybe around a campfire, the reason that you feel that heat energy is that it's radiating out through it. And that's the same way that we feel the sun's energy. It doesn't have to go through matter in order for that to happen. Whereas these other, these other two do have to have matter present because conduction has to do with the, um, the transfer of kinetic energy of those molecules. You have to have molecules and same thing with conduction and convection. By the way, you'll need to know the difference between these three concepts. Okay, the last of our three is radiation. And as I've mentioned a couple times, radiation does not depend on the presence of matter. Um, and we know that because thermal energy can be transferred through the vacuum of space. In other words, where there's no molecules present and the thermal energy of the sun is able to go through that just fine. It can, however, travel through matter. It just doesn't have to. And another um, type of radiation is called electromagnetic waves. And we aren't going to have time this year to talk a lot about electromagnetic waves, but I've listed some examples here. Um, ultraviolet light, infrared, visible light, x-rays, radio waves, and so on. So if you've ever known someone who has had cancer and had radiation, they have had um, an electro, they've been exposed to an electromagnetic wave that has pinpointed a particular location, and it causes that high energy wave to, um, usually it tries to kill the cancer cells. So that's that's an example of radiation. Um, all forms of radiation travel at the speed of light. 
Um, and that number is 3.00 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. It's really, really fast. In contrast, um, just so you are aware, the speed of sound is only 343 meters per second. So that's the reason why um, at sporting events, um, sometimes you see something before you hear it because the light wave travels faster than the sound wave. Um, that's why in a thunderstorm, you see the lightning before you hear the thunder, depending on where you're located. And then we already talked about the example of solar energy reaching the Earth through radiation. And this is just an interesting picture to show you um, some thermal radiation around the globe. So what you'll notice is that um, the heat energy of the globe is kind of centered around the equator and the two tropics. Um, and then as we move farther north, there's not as much heat energy um, radiating out. So for example, where we are, it's kind of a yellowish green. There's not as much heat or thermal energy being radiated out. So if you've ever looked at someone or looked through or maybe seen a movie where they use infrared um, goggles, what, what you're noticing is that um, even human bodies will give off some form of radiation, um, and that's based on the temperature of the human body. That heat energy is visible. So again, just a reminder, um, you need to know the difference between these. So we first talked about conduction. And again, this image <clears throat> isn't great, but it does a good job of uh, describing it. So if you were holding a metal poker and poking it into the fire, you would want to wear a glove. And the reason for that is because thermal energy can transfer from one object to another. And the heat from the fire gets transferred to that metal poker, and that poker eventually will heat up, which would hurt your hand. So you would always wear a glove when you're, when you're um, touching it. It's the same reason why a baking sheet heats up in an oven, um, and part of that is due to something called convection. But you would want to make sure that you use a pot holder or hold it with a towel because the temperature will be so large once your hand comes in contact with it, it could burn it. Convection, remember, happens when air molecules um, rise or change positions with other air molecules due to their heat. As something warms up, it becomes, um, it expands, and so the volume changes, causing it to either rise or fall when we talk about liquids, fluids, and gases. And then the last one is radiation. Radiation has nothing to do with the air. It simply is that energy being transferred to you through, um, through the vacuum of space. Okay, we're just about finished, so your turn. What's some practice here? Which one of these represents conduction? Which one represents convection? And which one represents radiation? And if you need to pause it to talk to your partner, you can. But hopefully you realize that the pancakes here on the griddle, this is an example of conduction. These aren't going to cook in the same way if you don't have them touching the pan. So this is conduction. The glass beaker over here, this is an example of convection because you can see that as, um, as it heats up, some of the molecules are rising and some are falling and they're going to continue to do that until equilibrium is reached. And then the top one, of course, is radiation, so the sun's energy heating us up. And by the way, this is the reason why you wear sunscreen when you go into the sun, because the sun's radiation actually can cause damage to your skin um, in the form of a sunburn. Okay, last slide and a couple of final reminders. For all three forms of thermal energy transfer, the following is going to be true. As we add energy, we increase temperature and thermal energy. So for example, if I have a pot of water on the stove and I add heat energy to that system by turning on the burner, what's going to happen is both the temperature of um, whatever it is I'm heating up, the water, let's say, temperature will go up and the thermal energy will go up. And the amount that that changes by, so the amount that the temperature goes up by and the amount that the thermal energy goes up by totally depends on the material, and that's what we'll talk about next class. And it also depends on the quantity or the mass of the object. And then the last thing that I want to leave you with is the fact that heat is a process or a movement. For many years, um, 
the scientists had no idea what heat was. They couldn't really describe it, and they didn't know. Um, they thought it was an actual thing, but what we know now is that it's a process, um, and we know that heat can be transferred between objects, and um, that ob heat energy always flows from a hot object to a colder object. So if we're finished with this now, um, what I'd like you to do is you can rewatch anything that you missed, um, but definitely take some time to begin um, looking at your study guide. And there are a couple of problems, numbers one through seven, that you can go ahead and answer on your um, thermodynamics problems worksheet for this week.